So that is those receptors, right? They're all embedded within the tissue over here so that it could have its particular effect, right? Increase heart rate, decrease salivation, increase heart rate, increase the airway breathing, increase glucagon uh, secretion, decrease your blood. The other thing was, remember, you had these sympathetic chain ganglia or the prevertebral ganglia where you had these short preganglionic fibers and long postganglionic fibers. And the one exception I said was that somewhere over here, this one long preganglionic axon came out. Remember, that's a myelinated one. And it's connected directly to this adrenal medulla over here, right? This little adrenal gland over here, a particular spot of it in the middle called the adrenal medulla. The hypothalamus tells these preganglionic neurons in your spinal cord to go and say, send out your axons, send the signal down, release acetylcholine instead of a the normal postganglionic and an autonomic ganglia. You have this axonless little modified neuron called the chromaffin cell that releases not norepinephrine, but epinephrine. And you know, this is going to have a lot of blood vessels going through it. So it's basically an endocrine gland, which is going to release epinephrine into the blood, right? Adrenaline into the blood to have its effect, right, body-wide. Right. So this is a kind of unusual situation because these modified postganglionic sympathetic neurons. Adrenaline instead of noradrenaline. Although your book, I think, says that it also releases noradrenaline. Don't, don't worry about that. Just we'll just pretend it's epinephrine. Because that book is the only one that says that. Might be true. I just don't know. So epinephrine released from the adrenal medulla. Okay, what are the what is the response of that, right? You are increased blood pressure, right? Because your heart rate is faster, right? Increased metabolic rate and glucose, blood glucose, because your cells are working a lot harder. Uh, you're changing your blood flow patterns towards your muscle and your heart and everything away from your digestive and kidney stuff, right? That normal parasympathetic stuff. So you're basically getting your body, you know, increasing your blood flow to all the things that make you got to be geared for action, right? And give you the energy to do it, right? Through breathing, oxygen, and glucose uh, to break down for aerobic respiration. Epinephrine, norepinephrine is going to be circular right around the blood and do that. That's one way I think when they do heart transplants and they haven't fully innervated your heart yet, your body, your heart can still respond a little bit uh, through uh, epinephrine floating around the bloodstream. All right. And the other thing, just to bring this back, you know, way back down when we talked about the activity of these receptors and all the G protein stuff and, you know, the overall effect, right? Epinephrine binds to receptor on liver and muscle cells, right? Although muscle cells, it will just be utilizing the glucose, but epinephrine binding there, doing this whole complicated process, which ultimately releases glucose into the bloodstream right there. All right. Uh, I also want to mention way back when we talked about the endocrine system, we talked about that stress response, your generalized adaptation syndrome. And so, you know, we contrasted this adrenaline, this hypothalamus, uh, those ones that were connected to the sympathetic nervous system, went and talked to ultimately the adrenal medulla to do this short-term one. Once this was done uh, in your body, kind of came back to normal. There was that other stress response from taking eight weeks of anatomy, right? That released this other hormones into your blood, which went not to the medulla, right? But the adrenal cortex, which gave off these other types of corticor hormones that were involved in this long-term bad stress response, right? This leads to general, you know, high blood pressure in different ways, right? Uh, increased blood glucose, right? So even without 
having a bad sugar diet, right? If you're under a lot of stress, right? You have high blood glucose, which causes havoc, right? It also suppresses your immune system. Not in any way we'll talk about, but that's just another response to uh, stress, just to remind us from way back. So all those were about dual innervation, right? You increase one, decrease the other, except for what we just talked about so far, right? The adrenal medulla secreting, right? Basically the epinephrine did not have a parasympathetic input to it. That was sympathetic only that went to the adrenal medulla. We don't have any input from our parasympathetic, from our craniosacral division, right? So that's one that doesn't have that, right? A couple other ones. Your blood vessels are the biggest one. They don't really have a major parasympathetic response. Most of your, almost your major blood vessels are not innervated by your parasympathetic nervous system, right? Your kidneys generally are not either. The adipose tissue to break down fat, your immune system, right, is generally not controlled by the parasympathetic response. These kind of things are done, you know, on a normal sort of basis, not by the nervous system, but in times of emergency, your sympathetic kicks in and kind of stops your, it kind of weakens your immune system, actually. If you've ever noticed, like if you ever had like a long period, like a lot of people have this, like after the semester ends, all of a sudden they get sick because their immune system kicks back in and all of a sudden starts responding to what it should have responded to a while back. So you're basically suppressing your immune system when you're under long stress. And then once you relax, you get sick. That's happened to me several times. In any case, these are dual, single innervated, right, by the sympathetic nervous system. But still, there's degrees, right? So how we're going to maintain a particular autonomic tone, called the sympathetic tone, you're going to increase or decrease our sympathetic activity above and below a sort of ton, what's called tonic level, right? When we talked about the heart, right, we talked about the, the dual innervation, right? We talked about the uh, those pacemaker cells by the parasympathetic and your sympathetic neurons, right? Sympathetic also is going to control blood vessels, whereas your parasympathetic notice is only talking to the heart, not the blood vessel, right? So when you have this kind of change in blood pressure, not only you're doing the heart, you're also going to kind of affect the blood flow in any particular region. You want to be able to control constriction and dilation for that, right? So for that, because you don't have dual innervation, what you have instead here, I wrote these obscure numbers right here, but what I was trying to get at was it's like driving a car, right? You're on cruise control, you set it at 55. That's a normal sort of tonic, right? You have a normal sort of signal that keeps it at a certain level of tension. However, if you need to increase it, you step on the gas a little bit, right? And this is where your signal beep, 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 right, going much faster. And this, in this case, it's showing it's contracting the vessel, right? Because it's that kind of norepinephrine, right? Whatever. So it's, in this case, it's contracting it from a baseline, right? Your tonic level has been increased. It's constricting. Whereas when you want to relax it, you take your foot off the gas, right? And there's less. And then because there's less input, these are going to relax and dilate, right? Increase the blood flow. All right, so this is just a you know, way, if you don't have that dual innervation, you have this sympathetic with its tonic level activity, and then you could increase or decrease that tonic level. And, and you know, in reality, this is how most of your nervous system is working within your nervous system, right? There's always a low level of activity, and then you can just slow it down or speed it up or something. But this is a way to keep autonomic tone in the absence of this dual innervation. That makes sense with our, my driving analogy. It's, it's, that's pretty clear how that might happen. Uh, all right, so we're almost done here, almost done. Uh, I wanna mention just to kind of maybe also, this is something that happens to me, for instance, uh, there is this phenomena called Raynard phenomena where like a little bit of exposure to cold, right? My whole life, I had this one finger over here that got, my brother has the exact same thing. One of his fingers got white, 
right? And that was due to some kind of weird construction of blood vessel. But in this one, its sympathetic stimulation has been increased for some reason, and you cut off blood flow, right? So this is what your color of your skin basically looks like without the vascular input right there. So in this case, there is a, a slight stimulation causes this overreaction of the sympathetic stimuli to cut off all the circulation in these extremities right here. Some of it has to do with low blood pressure. I think that's my problem. And some of it has to do with increased number of the particular type of adrogenic receptors. And so you can treat that by blocking those receptors. So yeah, mine might be the fact that I have many of this, or I, I do take a lot of that might be the other thing. So in any case, this is just one of those things where there's increased sympathetic activation, closing off in this case, decreasing the circulation to there. Because the blood circulation stuff is complicated, right? Based on the receptors of a particular area, right? And this is one of those homeostatic imbalances. That's it. That's all you have to know for this class, except to refresh all the stuff from the previous lectures, right? So, you know, just as a summary, right? We start off the last two lectures, hypothalamus, right? Uh, hypothalamus was the master regulator in contrast to your cerebral cortex, the primary motor cortex of your somatic motor system, right? And I had those nuclei that was controlling either the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, right? And then you had the output going down the brainstem, controlling the cranial nerves, right? The, mostly your vagus nerve, which was the main parasympathetic output. And in that pathway, you had those long post preganglionic fibers. They were cholinergic. They released their neurotransmitter on the postganglionic fibers uh, right close to the target. Right? They were pretty much embedded within the target. They released, they were cholinergic neurons. They released their neurotransmitter on the targets, which had neurotransmitter receptors. And it was very short because the ganglia was embedded within the target. Where's your sympathetic nervous system? The commands went down all the way down here, spinal cord T1 to L2. Right? And then there in the lateral horn motor nuclei, they sent out their preganglionic myelinated axons. They came in, they talked to the postganglionic one, sympathetic chain ganglia, and the collateral ganglia. Right? Those ones were those my, um, axons were unmyelinated and they went out to their targets and they did, they released noradrenaline in general on their targets. All that is functioning to maintain homeostasis and the balance, right, between the parasympathetic, sympathetic, a dynamic balance, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, depending on the situation. And, you know, the whole central nervous system part of this was your hypothalamus, as I said, controlling this autonomic pathway, right? You know, the hypothalamus controlling the autonomic pathway going to the sympathetic or parasympathetic, cardiac, smooth muscle, extra blue glands, right? And all this stuff, as opposed to the right, somatic one, which would go down, Go to your somatic motor neurons and do the skeletal muscle, right? Conscious, voluntary stuff, unconscious, involuntary stuff, right? Your somatic one was allowed you to walk through a room and not trip over things and move your body to go hunt an animal and eat it, right? Or get away from another animal that's trying to eat you. This is all internal stuff. And then just a little more detail here, right? Motor cortex, again, somatic motor neurons. The central ones in the, those primary motor neurons in the lateral and the ventral horn, right? Sending out their heavily myelinated axons through the ventral root out to its target, right? Stimulating, always stimulating with the acetylcholine on those nicotinic receptors. Whereas these, right, you'd have that secondary neuron, right, in that autonomic ganglia before they went to their targets. They would also would release stimulatory acetylcholine because they had nicotinic receptors. But then for your sympathetic 
that would go on to generally release nor adrenaline. And that would be depending on you know, plus or minus, depending on what the receptors were. And the postganglionic parasympathetic ones, we're going to release acetylcholine, typically on the muscarinic postsynaptic cell. Right. So, you know, just bringing it all back home for homeostasis, right? Just how does your body maintain normal physiological parameters, right? This was the big picture body systems, homeostasis type of stuff with the nervous system. Right? And I kind of went through a couple of pathways here, which, you know, if you had a chart, you should kind of be able to go back through that homeostatic, all the language we use for those homeostatic reflex arcs, right? All those mechanisms, which had a stimulus and a receptor and a control center, efferent, right? And effector organs and stuff like that, right? For cardiovascular, the respiratory. I didn't talk too much about the digestive system, but in general, right? What did, what did it do, right? Increased or decreased activity. These are the ones that kind of went a little more detail. So that actually is going to do it for this 